So we're still waiting for some of our inside walking friends to come back, which makes me think that inside walking might be more dangerous than walking in the forest. And I just saw that those young people have finally gone into the forest after days of walking around the car park with their staffs, trying to look hard, hardcore. They followed us oldies. We set the example. I asked them if they were going to catch some leeches. And they kind of looked confused. But they'll find out, won't they? <laughs> So, did anyone see the big creeper vine today? Very good. No, <laughs> well, that's a shame because, <laughs> yes. Trick question, trick question, right? <laughs> See if I can catch you out again. So, the creeper, if you had seen it, is quite thick and it's coiled around this tree. And it reminded me of the simile of the creeper vine used by the Buddha, which is that this creeper strangles the tree that it grows up around, and eventually it kills it and takes over. And this is a simile for the hindrances. The five hindrances are like that creeper vine that wraps around your mind and strangles it. And if any of you have, have been able to identify the hindrances and recognize the hindrances in your own mind, then you'll know exactly what it's like, right? When your mind is strangled by a hindrance, it's like you're completely absorbed in it. At last, you've attained some level of absorption in <laughs> In, in the mind, but it's in this really unwholesome object, usually, right? I was thinking actually about the World Cup. People are here missing the World Cup. I don't know who has been catching up late at night, but, but I remember watching my, watching my dad watching the World Cup, and he's like hyper focused. He could say, Dad, 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 Dad. He wouldn't hear it. Complete absorption. And sometimes I wish that we could transfer that kind of skill to a meditation practice, right? Why is it so easy to be completely fixated and aware of some things and then our meditation subject completely eludes us? A mystery. But I wanted to say a few words more about the hindrances and how we work with them. And I, I started saying yesterday how there's a level of enjoyment in them, right? That we kind of, we enjoy falling asleep a little bit, don't we? It feels nice, squishy, soft, like cotton, cotton wool. So we actually enjoy that feeling of going asleep. And we enjoy restlessness. That's how we've kind of conditioned our mind. Restlessness means excitement, adventure, novelty, fun. Um, we, we enjoy anger or ill will, and we, we know that we enjoy sense desire. We even enjoy doubt, you know, that intellectual game playing. Well, Pante Carlico says to do this, but my teacher said to do that. Well, I don't know about this, but I have to, and you know, you kind of debate amongst yourself or, you know, we enjoy not knowing sometimes. We enjoy um, we enjoy confusion in a way. We, we want to think through something. But the problem with doubt is it ends up being debilitating. So there's times when we enjoy the hindrance and this is what prevents us from abandoning it. You might find sometimes the hindrance can be very sneaky and you acknowledge it and you think that'll help. I'll see if I can let it go that way. But because you're still interested in it, even if you let go of it, it comes back. 
And because of the habit pattern of the mind, because these thoughts are quite sticky, it comes back. And sometimes it can even come back a bit stronger just to annoy you. And so there is a role for preventing, there is a role for abandoning, and there's also a bit of a role for investigation. We want to start checking out, where is this stuff coming from? Where did this come from? Why is it appearing now? What does it feel like, this hindrance? What are the qualities it has? Can I see the drawbacks in this hindrance? So sometimes it's useful to get a little familiar with the hindrance. That's what you've been doing the last few days, right? You've been getting familiar with it. But maybe you've just been experiencing but not really investigating it. So if you can't prevent it, if you can't abandon it and you're just stuck with it, then really get to know it a little bit. See if you can understand it a bit more. Why did the Buddha say this was a hindrance? What are the, what are the downsides of this experience? What is the enjoyment I get out of it? So you investigate. So this is kind of a very, a very useful thing to do. It helps us develop the knowledge of these states rather than just feeling like we just experience these things. We start to get some like, pro- professional kind of, you know, we're no longer amateurs. We're moving from being amateur meditators to, to professional meditators. We've got some sort of tools in our kit and we've worked on our mind. We've started to get some insight. We've got a deeper level of understanding now and we need to apply that. So we investigate and we see what's going on. And this will help us to abandon those states. So we use our mindfulness to know what's going on right now. That's what tells us, oh, this is sloth and torpor. So our mindfulness tells us When our mindfulness is weak, usually the hindrance has already taken over. And sometimes it would take a long time for us to identify, oh, I've been in the hindrance. But that's good. Your mindfulness has returned. So we need the mindfulness and we also need some investigation. So part of that investigating is to be done at the end of the meditation when you review. What were the things that led away from peace? What were the things that led towards peace? This is a question I've been asking you the last few days. Can you see how the mind works? What were the things that led towards peace? What were the things that led towards suffering or agitation or distraction or hindrance? How did it happen? What was the process? You were there, right? (laughs) You were there. (laughs) So so how how does it all work? And in this way, we start to see that we, we play an active role in our meditation, that we're actually part of this process. And that we... Uh, when, when a hindrance comes along, we decide at some level just how involved we want to get. And it's because we still enjoy it, we haven't seen the drawbacks, and we haven't yet trained our mind. And so as we go along, we're, we're seeing more clearly, using our mindfulness more clearly. We recognize faster. Ah, hindrance. We start to see much more clearly, right? That's why mindfulness is so important 
we finally are starting to see what's going on. There's a hindrance coming. Do I want to get involved? No! That was a trap. No, don't get involved. It's Mara. It's a trap. And then the mindfulness returns us to our breath. So the hindrance is just left like, uh, you know, have you seen the image of the, the, the videos of the creeper vines when they're looking for something to hang on to? They actually move around like little hands. It's very cute. If you ever get a chance to have a look on the internet, seeing the way creeper vines reach out and grab on, they move around. They move quite slowly, so we don't usually see them doing it. And But anyway, they're kind of, if they don't have anything to cling on to, they're just like looking. Yeah. <laughs> and so this is what the hindrance will, will do. Like if we don't give it something to hang on to, it just clutches its straws, so to speak. So we don't give it any, any attention. We return to the breath. Then if we find us overwhelmed, the hindrance has gotten hold of us, that little creeper has grabbed on, that's when we need to abandon it by practicing, uh, thinking of the drawbacks a bit more, investigating, or the best way is to simply let go of it. Just let go and return to your main meditation object. So how do we let go? We let go very gently firmly, but gently, we don't want to start generating ill will towards the hindrances. We've got to understand, ah, oh, this is my habit, ah, oh, this is a hindrance, it's okay, let go. And so you don't, you don't need to push, you don't need to give it a whack, you don't need to, to hate it or hurt it. No, it's like very gentle, ah, hindrance, return to the breath. There is a difference, though, between doing this skillfully and starting to repress or suppress things like strong emotions or memories from the past, um, uncomfortable feelings, lingering existential crises in your life, family problems, relationship problems, things like that. So this all comes up in your meditation, right? All your worries, all your concerns, all the stuff. And actually when you finally sit down and meditate for a while, you see the stuff that's under the surface. You've scraped away the outer layer of busyness and distraction, which covers up a lot of our deeper uh, embodied stuff, our unconscious stuff. And then when you've been med meditating for a little while, this stuff bubbles up to the surface and maybe it doesn't exactly fit one of the hindrances or you know it's just like some some unhappiness some discomfort some some memory from the past something that uh, just has come up and bothers you and so sometimes this stuff is important information about our life and our reality and the way we exist in the world and so it's tempting in meditation to start to explore this kind of stuff. And this stuff should be explored somehow, somewhere in your life. You have to look at these aspects of yourself. This is maybe a little bit more like therapy or time out of meditation where you just sit down and really think about what's going on. Sure, meditation helps us get in touch with that stuff, but our meditation isn't our therapy session. So we don't want to spend all our time working on this stuff. Maybe you can give yourself some time in your life, and you should, I think, where you reflect upon your life a little bit and you start to investigate how you're living, what's going on, what's the stuff that, that matters to you, what's the stuff that's been bothering you, but this is stuff that we do outside of our meditation practice and with a friend or with 
a therapist or with um, or by ourselves with a diary or something that helps us to reflect and become people who understand themselves better. But we don't want to waste our meditation time with all of our problems and lingering existential dilemmas, etc. It's really tempting, especially at this stage of the meditation process. The mind is getting so sharp and so clear. It's really tempting to use this for mundane, everyday, ordinary problems. The amount of people that come to interviews with me, not here, I'm not talking about anyone here, and they start talking about their problems at work, and it's like, you know, I mean, they're really stuck in that, you know, and this is, we have to deal with their problems at work, but not on our meditation retreat. But the reason why they're thinking about it is because their mind has become sharp and clear and they're looking to solve some problems. So they use this sharpness in their mind to solve a problem. And by doing that, they break the momentum of their meditation. You've been paying attention to the breath, paying attention to the breath, you're kind of going in this momentum. And then you're like, why don't I just think about this thing over here? Right? So the thing that's going to get you deeper and deeper into meditation is not solving your work problems or your social problems mid-meditation. It's going to be just keep on doing the thing that led to the clarity that you're enjoying. If you want more clarity, then don't distract yourself, don't break the momentum, keep going. And so just watch out for that tendency. But I do want to acknowledge that we don't want to suppress or repress our real authentic emotions, our real authentic problems, in the same way that sometimes we can sit with a hindrance for a little bit and do some investigation. It's okay to sit with those big issues too. Just know that this isn't the whole meditation session that you do that. You might just want to acknowledge them, remind yourself, I'll think about this later. Give yourself permission to just acknowledge, yeah, this feels really heavy, this feels really important. I'm going to put it aside and I'm going to focus on it later outside of my meditation. And in this way, you, you're not suppressing or repressing. You're acknowledging this important stuff in your life and then you give yourself permission to let it go and deal with it later so you can focus on your practice. So these things are really important. We, we, so, we so lack the time to reflect upon our life and if you want to be happy, then you have to do that at some stage. You can't expect meditation to make you happy. Um, you need to solve those life problems that are making you unhappy. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure, meditation will help, but it's not going to fix your problems at work, or it's not going to help you pay the bills, things like that. So I just, want to, just wanted to add those aspects to our understanding of how we work with the hindrances. So we've got some tools, you know, we can, we can prevent it, you know, block it off using sense, using our restraint, using our, our, our practice of substitution. We can abandon it when we realize it's ready, we can contemplate the, so when we realize it's here, we can contemplate the drawbacks. We can, we can investigate it, see what it is, where it's come from and see if that doesn't help get rid of it. And always gently letting go, letting go. Letting go is the best because it, it takes the least space in the mind, doesn't require you to get discursive and start thinking and analyzing, and returns you very quickly to the breath, which deepens your meditation. So we're going to meditate for 40 minutes. Yes, wonderful. Smiles all around. 
Okay, very good. So over to you and enjoy this 40 minutes of time with your mind.
So now we're coming towards the end of this session. Use this opportunity to review. How are you feeling? What's the quality of your mind like? Did you encounter a hindrance in your practice? What was it? How did it feel? Where did it come from? How did you deal with it? And how's your mindfulness? Does it feel like it's improving? Are there more periods where you feel aware and undistracted? And if so, how do those moments feel? Why do they arise? Where do they come from? So in this way we investigate our mind, we investigate the dhammas. I wasn't going to ring the bell, but then I thought you wouldn't know that it's lunchtime. So it's a very important duty I have. So you've got a few minutes before we, we have lunch. So thank you for working so hard and practicing so well. There's a few spots left on the personal practice chat list. If anyone wants to come and have a personal practice chat, a PPC, then you can. You put your name down on the list over here. And otherwise, if you have just a general question, you can put it in the box and I'll see if I can get to it tonight. And I'll see you all after lunch at three o'clock for more meditation. <laughs>